Thanks for passing me in my candidacy of defense or my defense 35 years ago. Um, so it was 35 years ago this week that I left actually Stanford for uh, Caltech. Um, many of you didn't have the great opportunity that I did to get advice from Bernie Rothering or PhD. So I will pass on one that he told me right before I went out for my first job talk. He said, Joel, on your best day ever, 10% of your audience will sleep. Just get over it. Um, and so, uh, Bernie, you can lead the chorus of snorers right now. Um, so besides uh, having spent uh, 40 years in robotics, I also work on biomedical devices. Uh, but today I want to use actually a kind of cheesy over-the-top uh, biomimetic uh, inspiration. So I sort of started working on my first robots over 40 years ago. And uh, we don't actually have robots that can do this today, uh, whereby you can swoop down. You actually, as you'll see later, have to carefully control the feathering of your wings near the ground because of a ground effect. Uh, you have to actually iterate and generate a lot of forces to control the grasping of that fish. Um, and I'm even more ambitious. I'd like to be able to do something like this while there's a big wind. Uh, and then maybe the person who owns that fish pond is not real happy uh, and throws a shoe at this uh, bird as well uh, for poaching that fish. Um, so I don't know how to solve all these problems yet, uh, but we're working on, on pieces that we'd like to sort of put together. And so I'm going to tell you about some of the pieces today uh, that hopefully will get us to this sort of future uh, of high performance in dynamic tasks. So using kind of the biological uh, idea for a minute, um, these are two model organisms that I've been evolving in my lab. Uh, the first one is called squid. Uh, it's a streamlined, quick, unfolding, investigative drone. Um, and the practical motivation is this. Uh, this work was funded by the military. And so what they'd like to have is if military are out in parole, on patrol and they want to be able to kind of quick uh, get uh, an eye in the sky to see what's happening, uh, for me, I'm actually quite inspired by the uh, unfortunately unpleasant fact that we have lots of fires in California, and plenty of firefighters oftentimes get trapped uh, in flames, and so it would be good if they could also quickly uh, get something into the sky very quickly to sort of get surveillance of what's happening in the nearby environment. So to launch a drone today, you typically have to put it on the ground and then sort of manually sort of help the launching process. Uh, drones sometimes are uh, failure-proof or failure-prone once they sort of take off. Um, also, they can't actually be shut off a moving vehicle. Uh, and moreover, they take time to kind of unfold and kind of deploy. So um, we spent a couple of years working on a couple of generations of these squid devices, uh, which can then ballistically be launched. And so um, our first squid, as you see here, looks like a World War II V2 rocket, because that's the most streamlined design uh, possible. It's the same diameter as a baseball, because this is a baseball pitching machine that launches it. And the sort of simple theory in this first version um, talking about dynamic tasks and stability is actually if you design this thing so that at every instant the center of gravity is above the center of pressure uh, during the arm unfolding process, it will be sort of passively stable. So this is actually out in the desert about two hours north of uh, Caltech. Uh, we actually were shooting these things off a truck at 50 miles an hour. Um, and so uh, here's sort of showing you the launch process. Um, there's actually a computer controlled mechanism that releases the arms at a predetermined height. Um, in this early version, there's actually, you can't see it, there's an actually world-class pilot on the side of the road who then sort of takes over control um, and helps sort of stabilize it. So here you'll see the bird's eye view of the launch process. And so after a little bit of tweaking and tweeting, the simple theory of a passive aerodynamic stability actually worked 100% of the time quite reliably. So the next thing we started looking at is can we actually autonomously stabilize these vehicles? Uh, and so this is a larger, we call it Squid 2, or as my students call it, the Kraken, because uh, it actually weighs uh, three kilograms. Uh, it can really hurt you at 70 uh, miles an hour if you're not careful. Um, and so this one actually has onboard autonomy, so there's onboard LIDARs and cameras and computing and things. Um, we also, because we wanted to launch it at higher speeds, and also uh, we found out uh, from our first one that these uh, drones experience forces over 100 G's uh, during the launch process. So you can imagine if you're shot out of a cannon at 100 G's, all your sensors are going to be uh, kind of completely kaflui. And so we have to sort of make this careful balance between passive um, stability when we launch and then sort of transition over to active stability and sort of figure out which sensors uh, can actually be deployed at which time and also uh, how to sort of stabilize this. 
So we uh, developed a kind of a scaling theory, which would allow us then to use uh, an open air wind tunnel at Caltech that you'll see uh, prominently several times today, uh, be used so that we can launch little two inch prototypes. And if we could stabilize these sort of little two inch prototypes uh, in the wind flow, which is coming this way, uh, launch at different angles, uh, the theory would tell us that we would actually be passively stable up to about 80 miles an hour uh, sort of launch speed. So um, here's, um, This is in the Center for Autonomous Systems and Technologies at Caltech. It's basically a drone arena and a robot arena. Um, in this particular version, uh, we actually release the uh, propellers and release these fins. So these large fins actually poke out of the wake stream so that um, it sort of passively stabilizes itself in a large range of sort of conditions. And so what you'll see then is there's a sequence of sensors turning on after they're sort of you know, blacked out from the 100G force of launching. Um, and then uh, we primarily then, the only sensor that really works throughout the launch process is sort of computer vision. So we use computer vision to stabilize these things uh, until they reach a, a sufficient height and actually then reach sufficient stability or, or quietness of the sensors uh, so they can take over and act like a regular drone. Now the problem is um, this thing will work 100% of the time in a fairly steady wind, but if you have a really complex wind like in the case of the uh, firefighters, uh, we're not sure whether this thing will be stable. But um, this uh, stability was enough that we've actually convinced the JPL, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, to change how the future missions to Mars will be done uh, by helicopters. So many of you are familiar with the current Mars helicopter, which has been a great success. It can only carry about a 50 gram payload. Uh, but because of our work, um, we're now uh, involved in two projects that I'll tell you about today um, with JPL to look at future drones for Mars. The first one is to use small ones like the one that you saw here, which could be then launched out of an aeroshell uh, in a larger mission to actually drop multiple investigators over the planet. The real one we're looking at right now is the MEX Mars helicopter, if it's funded by uh, Congress, we be about 13 feet in diameter in a hexacopter um, and carry about a three to five kilogram payload. And because of the work that we've done, we've shown that we're able to actually launch this in midair. So instead of landing it on the ground, it'll actually be deployed about five kilometers above the surface uh, and then sort of flutter down, which will allow us to get to new science areas that we can't get to right now and drastically reduce the cost of the mission. Now, the other problem that we're faced with in the future Mars helicopter mission um, is the ability to do science. That's actually what drives all these missions uh, in NASA and Congress. And so um, what the current rovers on Mars have found is that some of the most interesting geological and scientific sort of treasures are actually on the sides of very, very steep slopes. And so the question is, how do we get there? Um, and so with the limited payload that we have uh, from the uh, current, even future designs, um, it's almost impossible to get there. So the current idea is instead of sending rovers or astronauts there, is to actually uh, use a helicopter, but in the following way. So uh, you would drop the helicopter in the atmosphere and then drop a payload of a bunch of different sensor modules uh, down on the ground. The helicopter would then actually go find the sensor modules, uh, go do some reconnaissance uh, and figure out where it would be an interesting spot to place these modules, um, then actually pick up these modules and then sort of go have them grip onto the walls. And uh, the technology you use, as you'll see in a second, is the microspine grippers that actually came out of Mark Kakasi's lab. So um, one of the things you can imagine, and this is sort of where we've been pushing the envelope, is that actually these sensor modules will be very heavy, especially compared to the uh, weight of the drone. So those of you familiar with aerial manipulation know that trying to manipulate a very heavy payload on a drone is a tough problem because as you're shifting the center of mass around, it can become quite unstable, require huge, huge uh, lifting forces that are impossible to get uh, from conventional drones. So we have two innovations, one of which I'll talk about today and one maybe in a future talk. One innovation is a practical design. So this is a payload shifting uh, arm that actually deposits sort of the sensors. So actually the batteries and CPU are actually back here. Um, so as this sort of extends out, we actually maintain the center of mass to within about two or three centimeters of the sort of native one. Um, and so the idea then is that um, this arm has a special uh, end effector here, which can then deposit these payloads. Um, these payloads have marked microspine gripper on them, uh, then batteries, computers, and up to 500 grams of sensors. So the whole thing weighs about a kilogram and a half. Uh, and this drone's only three and a half kilograms, so we're talking about 40% of the payload of the drone. The other innovation is some new work on differential flatness uh, and nonlinear control using differential flatness. Uh, but we don't really need it here. 
And so um, these microspine grippers, because of Mark's brilliant work and Aaron Parnes, uh, can actually uh, hold these sensors up for over a month at a time. And then we've built an interface here so not only can we deposit them, but we can actually retract them and then go replace them um, as we go forward. So here's the basic idea uh, and why it's closer to that sort of biomimetic idea that I showed before. We can't just touch and go like most people do in aerial manipulation. We actually have to do a lot of manipulation with the environment uh, to get these things to be stable. So the idea is we uh, use an onboard camera to sort of take a target uh, identified by a human operator uh, and sort of servo on that. Um, then we actually uh, contact the wall and press into the wall so we get sufficient forces uh, and then the microspine gripper coordinates with the computer to kind of close and grip. Uh, then actually the uh, drone using a force sensor pulls on the sensor uh, and to test that it's okay and then it kind of releases. So let's see all that in action. Again, this is in our drone facility at Caltech. So this is manual at this point. Now it's switching over to autonomous. This tether is not necessary. It's just for a requirement for safety. Uh, so now you're seeing it extending out the arm. Again, you're seeing it keeps the sort of stable balance relatively easy because of the mass shifting capability. Uh, at the end of the arm is the payload there. That thin thing is the sensor. That's actually a basalt rock, um, actually, that's very similar to native basalt on Mars. There you can see the close-up, and then over on the side there, um, you can see actually all the data in terms of either position or later actually in terms of forces. Um, and so now it's pushing, it's coordinating with a microspine gripper. Um, it pulled on it, and then it sort of found um, that it could detach. So this is great. We're very happy with this. Uh, but we're now interested not only on Mars, um, but actually uh, doing this in the real world. And so um, how can we take things like um, the Kraken that I showed you before um, and work them in very complex flows like in a fire uh, or take this and work in the outside world where you may have things like uh, when these vehicles get close to a wall, uh, there's a, a sort of interactive fluid uh, structure interactions uh, that actually cause complex uh, forces to be applied to the drones. Uh, and particularly, like I said, if you're working in close proximity, you know, in some kind of building or other kinds of things, the flows there are very complex and make the control very difficult. The other thing is out in the real world, um, we're also going to have lots of sort of, you know, winds and biases, et cetera. So um, how can we adapt to these effects? So I'm going to sort of talk about two techniques today. Um, so the first one, uh, for those of you who read my abstract, is based on uh, the idea of a coupon operator. But before I get into the ideas of that, uh, let me just quick give you a survey of actually how pretty much all learning for flight control and actually even general robotic uh, vehicle control goes. And so the idea is assume that you have some dynamical system. We can describe um, its governing mechanics by some equation, x dot equals f, uh, the dynamics of x, the state, u, the control, and w is some disturbance or unknown force or unmodeled dynamics. Um, so you can either say, hey, I've got a nominal uh, control system. So like in drones, we can just use the onboard neutral controller when you're actually out not near uh, buildings or in complex flows, and that works pretty well. But when you're in a complex environment, then what you may want to do is learn sort of this disturbance, as we call it, or residual, as we call it. So this is called residual learning. The other, and I'm going to talk about that second, um, the other approach is you can actually uh, try to learn the dynamics directly. Um, and for particular reasons, because if you can learn the dynamics directly, then you can apply actually control techniques where you can get things like guaranteed stability, guaranteed safety, um, and um, also start to you know, answer questions about how much data do I need to learn, um, et cetera. So what we'd like to do is to not only be safe during deployment, but actually be safe and rigorous and stable and provable during the learning process as well. So um, I know these techniques are not yet popular at Stanford, um, although I know Marco Pavoni's group is working with George Holler on things that are related to it. Um, but if you've never seen Koopman uh, techniques before, the idea is very straightforward. So if I start with an autonomous uh, dynamical system, x dot equals f of x, I'm ignoring the control right now. Uh, normally what you do is you sort of study the flows of that dynamical system, which may be nonlinear, and you study kind of the geometry of the phase space. And so all the theory is based on how these uh, geometry sort of, uh, you know, uh, evolves over time to study stability or robustness or convergence, et cetera. Back in 1932, uh, Koopman 
uh, came up with this idea, which was basically lost to time until around 2000 when it was kind of rediscovered uh, by a person who was doing this PhD at Caltech, Igor Mezik. Um, and what Koopman sort of said is, instead of looking at the state space, let me define a space of observables. So an observable is something like momentum, energy, could be the actual coordinates of the state system as well. Uh, but that space now is a function space instead of a finite dimensional state space. And what Koopman showed is that actually um, there's an equivalent linear but infinite dimensional system um, which actually mimics the dynamics of this finite dimensional nonlinear system. And so in theory then, if you're willing to pay the price to lift this to very, very high dimensions, you can then use sort of linear control theory on this potentially. There's a problem we'll see in a second. Now, in practice, no one wants to work with the infinite dimensional system and the real engineering system. Um, so what people do then is lift this up to, let's say you have a three degree of physics system here, you might lift this to 14 dimensions, 15 dimensions, and make a finite approximation to this infinite dimensional lifting. But the thing that you know is if you're willing to pay that price um, is you get a truly sort of linear system. It's guaranteed to be linear. Uh, now, the finite dimensional approximation, there's some issues and there's still ongoing work to understand the effects of those approximations. So now, when we add control inputs, it's not quite as pleasant. Um, and what you find is that actually, um, when you try to do that lifting process, um, the sort of autonomous part goes fine. That actually does lift to a actually linear part, but the control part doesn't. Um, it lifts to this sort of very complicated equation uh, right here, um, but under certain conditions which are satisfied for almost all relevant engineering and robotic systems, what you can show is all this term here uh, collapses down and by change of coordinates can be made a simple product of a constant matrix G times a vector Z, which is the lifted uh, sort of variables. So it's a bilinear system. So it's not quite linear, but it's sort of bilinear. Um, and so uh, there's a rapidly growing, uh, actually, research field in this area. And so what our group has been working on is how do we actually learn these sort of bilinear systems uh, directly from data? That's the brilliance of the Koopman idea, is that because you're working in the space of observables, you don't have to measure the state. What you do is you measure actually how the system looks to you in the real world, and that gives you the indirect information about what's happening uh, in the state space. So um, now the problem is, of course, is both how do we do this from data, and the other thing is the original theory uh, that developed these sort of techniques assumed uh, that actually all the control inputs that you use to ID the system were open loop, uh, which is a disaster for robotics, of course. You can't just run your robot around and let it crash everywhere. So um, we've uh, um, developed a number of techniques, and the reason we like the Koopman thing is because then um, you can use the favorite tool that uh, robot engineers love to use, which is model predictive control. Um, so this is an optimal control technique. So you have some cost function. Um, so now the cost function is going to be in the control inputs, like regular model predictive control. And it's now going to be in the lifted states. So you use reg regular linear MPC-like ideas. Again, the key advantage of using these Koopman techniques is if you can learn this model, then you can actually uh, do control with constraints. In reinforcement learning, you can't actually learn and actually have constraints taken into account. So this learning method, any kind of constraint that you can imagine, we can build into the calculation process and then effect into the learning process. So we can learn with constraints, execute with constraints, and you know, that's what real engineers we you know love to do. So now, because it's a, a bilinear system and not truly linear, um, we have to do an approximation in the MPC. So I, talking with lunch today with most people, it seems like you guys are familiar with sequential quadratic programming. Uh, and so we use a sequential prog quadratic programming uh, technique to do that. So um, because I wanted this to be more of an overview talk today and not too technical, um, you'll see a bunch of list of papers here uh, if you want to go sort of find further details. So um, I'm just going to gloss through this one quickly. Um, those of you who are familiar with fluid mechanics and know something about a DMD, dynamic mode decomposition, uh, we've sort of figured out the equivalent of dynamic mode decomposition um, for uh, these sort of robot control problems. And so the idea is you fly your drone around or you drive your vehicle around uh, and you sort of gather a bunch of data, uh, you go through a bunch of calculations and out pops a bilinear approximation of a particular dimension that you have to actually specify ahead of time. So that's still an open question. I'm not going through many details there because it seems like most of the world these days uh, is interested in deep nets. 
Uh, and so just recently, last year, uh, one of my students uh, figured out actually how to put all of this in a deep neural network. Uh, you can go see the details, but I'm gonna give you the concept right now. So in order to do this Kuban learning, what we wanna figure out is how do we lift? So we need this lifting function, which is called a Kuban eigenfunction. So you need to learn the eigenfunction. All right, so we use that uh, autoencoder to basically minimize the error between the projection of the lifted function and the actual state data that we get. Then um, you have a part which actually uh, looks at how good is the predictive capability of this lifted model, right? You want it to be able to mimic the system. And then finally, we have a part which actually learns the sort of bilinear realization of the system. Uh, and so you can then have a deep neural network which actually has three terms. It's make a good lifting, all right? Make it predict well, uh, and make sure you learn sort of the dynamic F and G matrices properly. Um, okay, so let's see this in action. So um, here's a little crazy fly. Maybe those of you know that these are five or six inch diameter drones. And so this is again um, in our uh, flight arena at Caltech. So on the top is after three minutes of training, um, this is what actually our Kuban model can do. On the bottom is sort of a state of the art nonlinear model predictive control. So when we're having them actually fly at 25 centimeters or 10 inches above the ground, the ground effect is there, but it's not very large. So both of these things look equivalent, but actually if you look carefully at the data, what you find out is um, the Koopman model actually learns the ground effect very well, so it's actually able to keep the desired 25 centimeter height. The ground effect actually adds extra buoyancy to the drone, uh, and so what happens is it sort of flies the right trajectory, but it's way too high because it doesn't understand these buoyant forces, and also doesn't understand how the buoyant forces vary with height. All right, so now let's actually try to have these drones fly uh, below the level where actually the ground effect is very important. So this is less than the diameter of the drone. Uh, so what you'll see on the bottom is the nonlinear model predictive control actually crashes repeatedly. Uh, it actually can't fly. We can actually get these drones down to one inch above the surface you know, at full speed uh, and actually sort of control them without crashing or, stable, or, or being unstable. So there's a little bit about uh, learning. The second part of my talk was about uh, risk, and I'm gonna couple the two at the end of each other. And so, uh, you know, this is a huge problem in robotics. I'm not the first person to study this. Uh, there's much active work here um, at Stanford, which is why I wanted to talk about this today. In fact, uh, Professor Pavone wrote a lovely, lovely paper on the role of risk in robotics. And so, in general, not even necessarily thinking about risk, um, what you'd like to know is if uh, robots are now gonna operate in human-like environments where there's kids playing ball and dogs running around and cars sort of driving, uh, you know, how should they model the world? Um, how should they sort of plan their emotions to account for all the uncertainty? And we're also dealing with learned systems. So actually, how should they account for the fact that they actually don't fully understand their learned models as well? Uh, and so uh, classically, as at lunch today, I heard some of you are working on stochastic motion planning. That's great. So, uh, you know, these kinds of problems can be formulated in the following way. Um, I want to plan a trajectory, and it deals with uncertain system. So I have an uncertain model of the world. Um, you know, choose your favorite distribution. We'll talk about that later. And so I'll take some cost function, which may be nonlinear, and I'll try to minimize that cost function, even with the unmodeled or partially modeled disturbances, and then potentially with some kind of constraints that deal with the fact that I don't want to bump into kids or crash my drone or crash into another car. So the major approaches up until a couple of years ago were either, uh, again, uh, planning an expectation, so you figure out what's the expected value of the problems that you're gonna face, all right, and also make what's called a chance constraint to make sure that your constraints of not bumping into things are probabilistic, so you wanna make sure there's a minimum probability that I don't clash or crash into something uh, using sort of some physics model of how I would crash or how I would bump into people. Um, or um, you could use minimax or worst case kind of planning, uh, which is um, I'll minimize the maximum worst case of this uh, function, uh, again, uh, using constraints. Um, but we don't have to use those two extremes. Um, there's actually extremes in the middle. And so particularly um, if we have some kind of distribution of uncertainty here in this sort of one-dimensional cartoon, uh, planning and expectation is planning sort of for the mean. Uh, planning in worst case is planning at the very sort of worst possible disturbance so that you basically take care of all of these disturbances up here, but you get very, very conservative and rather sluggish kinds of results. 
the mean is good, you'll typically get nice sort of you know, proactive kind of uh, planners, but you ignore the tails and you still get collisions because of the tails. So um, the risk-based view of this is to sort of say, hey, um, you know, there's other parts of the distribution that we may be concerned with or different ways to actually calculate the cost uh, of dealing with these uncertain distributions uh, in our world. And so uh, that's where risk-aware planning comes in, is actually using the different uh, calculi on sort of the uh, possible uncertainties. And so um, we can also then um, formulate our um, <clears throat> chance constraints in here. So normally, with a chance constraint, uh, we have the goal that actually the probability that will violate our chance constraint um, exceeds some kind of threshold. <clears throat> and in the case of the chance constraint, what we can do is instead of actually thinking about the probability in terms of mean or worst case, uh, we can actually kind of titrate somewhere in the middle and again use different sort of ways to measure uh, the uncertainty, as we'll talk about in a moment. And more importantly, um, everyone knows in robotics that you don't want to assume a Gaussian or some other distribution. You don't know the distribution at all. And so what you'd really like to be able to do um, is to actually handle all kinds of distributions, not every possible distribution, but a, a big range of distributions um, that you think will either be at play or that actually you can actually uh, come up with numerical techniques to find the limits of these distributions uh, sort of during uh, your learning or execution phase. So in essence, learning the expectation then over these distributions um, will kind of get you close to kind of the mean uh, kind of problem. Uh, but again, um, we can actually now think of actually a risk-based uh, sort of a distributionally robust sort of way of looking at the world. What we're saying is, um, especially I'll talk about a little bit later, something called CVAR, which is conditional value at risk, which is what's it gonna cost me on average to be sort of robust against this tail here? So now um, in a distributionally robust way is what's it gonna cost me to be robust against the tail of all possible distributions um, in my distribution set? So, um, in the finance literature starting about 25 years ago, uh, people started thinking about these ideas. They first came from finance where there's real money involved. Uh, and so there's a class of risk measures called coherent risk measures. Um, and the ideas um, are quite simple. Uh, so if you have four properties, uh, translation and variance, which means if I add a constant which is not uh, uncertain to my uh, cost, um, then it'll just add a constant cost uh, to my risk uh, evaluation. Uh, if I have more uncertainty, I should have more risk, um, uh, basically a triangle inequality for a risk and uncertainty, uh, and then a multiplicative effect as well. And if your risk um, measure um, actually satisfies all these four properties, um, then there's something called the representation theorem, um, which tells you the following thing, uh, which is the actual risk measure is equivalent to the following convex optimization. So it's the optimization over the convex set of a set of uh, unknown distributions of whatever your sort of cost function is. And so those of you who worry about real-time controls know that if we can always reformulate a problem in terms of uh, convex uh, properties, we can then use convex optimization to actually get real-time performance. And so um, over there is just showing you some of the different uh, types of risk measures that people have introduced and actually sort of the geometry of the convex sets um, that are equivalent to those risk measures. Okay, so let's put this to work. Um, the first place we worked it, used it was actually just in static environments. So I'm proud to say I'm the only person on Earth who's actually been in all five DARPA challenges. Uh, and so this is the most recent challenge, uh, the subterranean challenge, where we had to send uh, teams of robots into underground tunnels and caves and structures uh, to actually go find 40 objects that we'd never seen before. So we knew there was a cell phone, we just didn't know what brand cell phone it was. We knew there was a red backpack, but one that we'd never seen before. And we also actually had to report their location very accurately or we didn't get a score. We had to do this all in one hour. And um, there could be no humans in the course. You could only have one human on the outside talk to your robots if you built your own communication network uh, and brought your own light and brought your own power. So, um, 
you know, these, some of these environments were very, very complex and strewn with rubble. So we wanted to actually do some terrain analysis. And we actually found these risk sensitive ideas to be very, very useful for kind of terrain analysis. So using all the different kinds of sensors, um, we actually came up with different risks based on how uh, rugged the terrain was, how sloped it was, how much the elevation was, how likely were we to kind of collide with things. Um, you'll see with water and other kinds of things. Uh, and so then uh, we just used uh, an actual occupancy grid map, uh, but we actually then evaluated each cell by this conditional value at risk. So what's the cost of the tail of the uncertainty and then we actually combined all of these um, um, different metrics together into one risk cost, and then used the risk to actually plan the motion of the robot. So this is in, if you've been up to Northern California, to Lava Tubes National Park. Uh, this is in Lava Tubes National Park. Um, this is um, a spot from Boston Dynamics. These things are fantastic, but they're dumb as a brick. Um, and so you put all your own autonomy on it. And so there you see this robot is exploring this part of the cave. And so what you see is the risk map there. It's sort of saying, hey, how risky is it for me to kind of wander around? You may say, like, why did it, I'll play it again, why did it actually uh, go in this little corner here? Because it was actually trying to cover uh, this area. And so this little corner that you'll see in a second, um, it's like, hey, I haven't really seen back there, so I need to go back there and see if there's a body back there or something that's going to kind of give me a point. All right, but then it sort of figures out the risk of sort of going back there. Um, and so here's something that would be difficult to do for a regular occupancy grid planner. So this is in a limestone cave, actually, in Kentucky. Um, and so this was during a, a simulated sort of final contest. It was two weeks before the final contest. And so the robot was trying to get up way up high there. And it actually had to find a, a route through. This is the operator voice. Um, so it actually had to find a route through all of that rubble there. And so it used these risk-based maps to do it. And the other thing we can do with risk is we had an hour to complete these things. So we actually dialed up the risk as the time got late. So we, the robots would do riskier and riskier things. So this robot actually fell down about three minutes after this video because it was in the extreme risk mode. and It was just willing to do anything uh, to try to score. OK, um, here's one of the intermediate finals. Uh, we actually had to uh, totally scour a three floor a nuclear reactor core up in Washington State. Uh, so this is about 50 meters on a side uh, and a couple of grounds, uh, floors underground. Uh, this nuclear reactor was built but then never commissioned because it went bankrupt. Uh, so there was no actually radioactive uh, activity in there. And so let me just uh, show you a couple of minutes. Um, so we actually had five robots out on the course um, in this particular video. Um, so the way the competition works is once your robots pass that door, um, they're on their own. Um, they have an hour then to go find things. Um, so uh, not I'm talking about today, but there are things like automatic stair detectors. So it would automatically figure out their stairs because we didn't know how many floors there were. It turned out there was three. Um, and so we had to go explore all the possible floors uh, that could be found there. So it's doing all this autonomously. What you'll see when it gets to the bottom is because there's no radio communication in here, each of the robots dropped its own radio node. Um, to actually build a communication network. So as it gets to the bottom here, you're going to see it's going to squat down and actually deliver um, a node, uh, which then allowed it to be the main communication node for the basement of this nuclear reactor. So here's the rear camera. Now, we didn't have this view when we were operating. The only thing we could see is what the robot saw. And remember, we had five robots streaming video, so the operator is very busy. This was video DARPA gave us later that we could piece together with our own video. And so it knows about doorways and other things. And so um, here, there's water. DARPA told us if you see water, it could be up to six feet deep. Um, and so water was a no-no. Uh, and so what you see is it actually recognized um, this as water and said, that's a big risk I don't want to take. Uh, and so you see it deviated around that risk rather than actually walking through that risk because of this risk-based uh, terrain analysis. So I won't play the whole video. I'll try to go towards the end here. So this is kind of the map that was put together in one hour by this team of five robots uh, walking up and down sort of multiple stairs. So I said, this is about uh, almost 10,000 square meters uh, that actually covered in one hour. Uh, and then what you'll see is actually all the different artifacts that it found, um, you know, like a, a, a human dummy and backpack and cell phone and, and things like that. 
Okay. All right. It's okay to avoid things that are stationary, but what about when you have moving obstacles? How can you actually use risk actually to handle moving obstacles? And so um, we've been studying the following thing. Um, so uh, let's go back to my a person throwing a shoe um, at the hawk who's sort of picking up the fish. Um, so now imagine you have a drone and it's doing some kind of uh, patrolling motion. Um, so it's got a regular task. Uh, and then someone's angry at it or some kid is just not paying attention. Uh, and so someone uh, then potentially you know, throws a frisbee or throws a football or is playing badminton nearby. And let's assume you have some sensors on board uh, the drone. Um, so you can particularly pick, pick up these objects, but you may not know anything about them ahead of time. So what you'd like to find out is, can I actually quickly online uh, learn the effective dynamics of each obstacle um, and then uh, avoid them as necessary using a risk-based approach? So um, what we decided to do is take a real minimist, minimalist approach, and that is we assume we can actually even measure the state of these dynamics. All we'd actually have available to us um, is that we could sign, find some point on the obstacle, probably the center, and we could track that point. Um, and we assume we could track it about as fast as the planner can work. And actually, these were actually very noisy signals. So the only thing we had was just streams of data coming from tracking this vehicle, possibly corrupted by noise. Now, in this first work I'm talking about here, we assume the noise was Gaussian, but in recent work that we haven't published yet, uh, it can be actually any arbitrary distribution. So here's the problem. So um, someone throws a Frisbee um, at the drone while it's patrolling. So what you'd like to be able to do is to actually learn about the Frisbee dynamics quickly enough that I can then take it into account and then avoid it um, with high probability. And so we'll have to make some assumptions. Um, and the assumptions are basically, uh, first, we can capture its dynamic with a certain class of dynamical systems. It's actually a quite large class. Um, so that's not a real restriction. Uh, and we can actually uh, find its coordinates on a regular basis. Um, and that it actually has some maximum speed, right? So if someone shoots a bullet, you're, you're not going to avoid the bullet. Uh, it's just too fast. Um, so it has to have some bounded speed. We don't know what that speed is yet. Um, and so um, we actually found an old idea from the 70s, which turned out to be almost Koopman. Um, so we're turning this into a Koopman theory, but it's not quite there yet. So we take these data streams, um, and then we do the following things. So the first is we embed them into what's called a Hankel matrix. All of you who have used linear identification theory know about Hankel matrices. These are used in control system identification. Then we actually um, do an eigen decomposition of these matrices. So we just break them up into eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We assume there's noise there. So then what we use is a kind of the optimal denoising theory that was actually developed here at Stanford uh, by David Donahoe. So that <clears throat> we take this Hankel matrix and we basically split it up into parts which are real signal and parts which are noise. Now normally people throw the noise away, but we keep the noise and you'll see why in a second. So then um, the part that's not noise, we then sort of learn what's the dimension um, of the dynamics of this system from Tockens and Betting theorem. It gives us an approximate dimension of the system. Uh, and then um, we sort of basically fit a dynamical systems to that as we're evolving with the data. In the beginning, the knowledge of the dynamics is very poor and the noise is very big. All right. And so this particular class of dynamical systems we call are called linear recurrent relationships. It's basically an autoregressive kind of technique. Um, and what you can do is you can find all the coefficients for the autoregressive model uh, directly from the eigenvectors um, of the Hankelization that you did before. So the brilliant part now is that actually uh, normally what you would do um, in regular sort of theory is you would say, let me take the mean trajectory that I predict. But what we do is we take all the samples of the noise and then we produce a bootstrap, uh, basically 40 to 50 samples of the noise to sort of say these are all the trajectories that actually fit uh, within the sort of noise spectrum that we've actually learned with the data so far. Uh, and so what we want to do is actually, uh, again, in a risk-aware way, is worry about the tails of this distribution of trajectories rather than the mean of this trajectory. So the next step gets a little wonky and a little bit fast. Uh, but uh, just listen to my words rather than worry about the equations. So the key thing is we want to do a model predictive control. So we assume that the agent we're controlling, our drone, is in this earlier version linear. Now it can be arbitrarily nonlinear. And what we'd like to do is, given kind of constraints on its motion, 
um, and, and then we want it to avoid all these obstacles. We can avoid multiple obstacles. And the only thing we know about the obstacles is sort of the data that we've actually derived so far online. All right, so we use these bootstraps then to produce sets of possible distributions of the obstacles. Um, and then uh, we'd like to make sure that we avoid these sets in some risk-aware way. And so we then assign a risk cost. How much risk are we willing to tolerate uh, from the distribution of these obstacles so that we avoid them? Um, so then, uh, the, unfortunately, the kind of constraints you have to deal with are such that it doesn't fit into a nice convex form. Uh, here's the part I'm going to gloss over. Uh, using a bunch of magic from my students, um, they sort of figured out how to convert this into both a, 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 a sequential quadratic programming problem uh, and actually a, a cone problem, a second order cone problem, uh, and then actually formulate a certain sort of a variables which then allowed for linear uh, constraints. Um, and then what we could do is, this is the key magic, as we say now, our chance constraints, instead of looking for the mean, what we're doing is we're doing the analysis of the uh, possible contact or conflict or collision with all distributions that actually have the same mean and the same covariance as the data we have at that point. So we're saying that's the best approach, you know, approximation we have, but we know that it's a limited data set, so there may be other distributions you know, outside of that. So we sort of make this distributionally robust against sort of all possible data interpretations um, that we have. Now, this is a horrendous calculation. Uh, and so again, uh, a couple more magics you can go see in the paper in the extended version is we find a way to reformulate this um, and then actually convexify it um, so we can actually do real-time uh, actually calculation of this. So we can actually do this 20, 30 times per second uh, in MATLAB. Uh, so it's, it's real, real time. Um, we haven't implemented it yet, so we're working on that. Uh, but here's sort of a simulation. So the idea is this will play over and over again, is um, we've looked at both uh, footballs, frisbees, uh, constant velocity obstacles. Um, and so the idea is that actually uh, this is more risk averse. And so you see there's very large deviation maneuvers. Uh, and here you're willing to tolerate more risk. And so you'll see on that side, there's very little sort of deviation, okay? Now, the interesting thing, and this is why I'm really plugging this point, is we did uh, 10,000, uh, actually this, not 1,000, 10,000 Monte Carlo simulations of different risk levels and different types of objects. And so what we found is uh, plotted along here, feasible means um, what percentage of these 10,000 simulations could we actually find a solution? And then next is of the feasible solutions, what was the percentage of avoiding the obstacle? So 100 means we avoided the obstacle, all right? D min is how close did the obstacle get to us, closest possible value during our patrol. So this is very risk averse. When you get to risk equals one, this is actually stochastic planning. So this is expected value planning. So what you see, expected value planning, you always get a solution, but up to 40% of the time it actually got hit by the obstacle. Uh, when you take risk into account, almost 100% uh, of the time, uh, it actually avoided the obstacle. And there's no penalty in, in cost because we reformulate it in a way that's very fast. Yes, we lose a percent or two in feasibility sometimes, so we're still working on that. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna wrap up now um, with the following idea. You can actually use uh, risk actually for learning as well. So this is very recent work. Um, I can send you the paper. We submitted this to L4DC. So let's go back and think about uh, our drones again or other robotic vehicles. And we have a nominal model, and then there's some uncertainty. But let's say your nominal model is pretty good, but then all of a sudden you go out like you're autonomously drone racing, and a big wind kicks up that day. You'd like to learn that wind really quickly, all right? Um, you know, it may be transient, so it may not be around very long. So you have to have a very, very fast learning process. So, um, Prithvi Akella, uh, a student of Aaron Ames, and then one of my students, uh, Skylar Way, uh, came up with the following idea. So, we saw risk before. So, instead of thinking about risk about a random variable here, we think what we, we uh, introduce what we call a surface at risk. So, even though there's a fancy jargon here, the idea is very straightforward. So, this transient disturbance here may have a mean part and may have some stochastic variation to it. So, I'd like to learn it. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna now bound 
find actually an envelope that's risk-based. So I'm going to say, if you give me a certain level of risk, I'll find, I can define an envelope of this disturbance right here. So what we do then in real time is we just use a Gaussian process to quickly learn this bounding envelope. We then use a robust control the Apanov technique, which has disturbances built into it. And so the idea is if you can quickly learn this disturbance by quickly identifying which parts of the disturbance are going to screw you the most, um, then actually learn those quickly and be able to stabilize yourself quickly in the presence of that disturbance. Uh, and then if the disturbance goes away, you can kind of forget that term. So let's see this in practice. So here's, again, back in our drone arena. So this is first the um, ground effect one. So here, this drone doesn't know anything about the ground effect, and it's trying to actually execute that path up there. And it's doing it, but it's moving slow because it has these buoyant forces uh, that it doesn't know about. So it recognizes, like, look, there's something out of distribution here that I don't understand. So let me take some time. And in this case, it only took 45 seconds. So it actually does a couple of motions. It learns about the drone effect, about the ground effect. And then after it, those motions, it can actually track quite precisely. It can actually then travel up to three times the speed as before, um, even with the same accuracy. OK, that's the ground effect. What about other kinds of things? So in our drone arena, we have a kind of unique in the world uh, fan wall. There's 1,600 individually controllable fans here. So we can generate very complex wind flows. And so now this drone is trying to follow this sort of spatial maneuver here. Um, and it, it learned, uh, or its control was designed without wind, and now there's two to four uh, seconds of wind, two to four meters per second of wind uh, in this case. So y you can't see the smoke, but you can see back here the curtains blowing. So there's the def you know, evidence of the wind, and it's trying to follow this trajectory, but the wind kind of keeps blowing it because it doesn't understand um, this wind. So again, with less than a minute of data, uh, just driving through that wind, um, it can then now very quickly and accurately kind of track um, some trajectory. It's not perfect, uh, but it's getting there. But like I said, it's very, very little data. OK, I went fast because Mark told me I had 10 minutes less than I had planned. Um, and it's actually perfect uh, because um, this is kind of my concluding, almost concluding slide. Um, so we have a new DARPA program, which is called Learning and Introspective Control, where we're trying to put all these ideas together. So in this program, which is motivated by the following problem, uh, people in the military sometimes go out on patrol and overload their vehicles with stuff, and they roll over and die. So they like to have an onboard control system that could automatically detect if the vehicle's working out of spec, uh, then actually decide if we need to redesign the control system, what data do we need to learn, and actually maintain safety at all times during the learning and post-learning process. The way we're testing this is doing absolutely crazy stuff. This is just from two weeks ago out in the um, actually Arizona desert. We actually have to drive over these very complex terrains. Uh, and then we have things like water tanks on top where they bury the water and it sloshes around. You can't tell, but there's a 20 mile with 40 mile an hour gust winds. So we have the sail on here. So it tilts it up so there's very little traction sometimes. So the traction slips all the time. And so uh, here we're having to do kind of, you know, sort of figure eights. Not in this test, but over the next year, they have to do things. They're going to drop out sensors arbitrarily. They're going to change the control inputs arbitrarily for short periods of time and introduce all kinds of other artifacts. And so the idea is, can you make a bad driver good? And can you take any driver when all hell breaks loose and keep them safe? Um, and so we're trying to put all these techniques to use right now. So uh, thank you for listening to me speak very quickly. And one of the reasons I came here today, I came here today for two, two reasons, to see Mark and Bernie. And I'm looking for postdocs. Um, so if you're looking for a postdoc, let me know. All right? Yeah, thank you for the talk. It was really exciting. So I saw that in the video, all the drones were tethered. So what the tether is a safety tether that's required by our, our, our flight testing. OK, so now what mechanism do you use to make sure that the, the dynamics from the tether is not affecting the flight? Yeah, so we spend a lot of time on that. Um, so there is an effect. I can't tell you that there's not. Uh, but it's a disturbance. So in some ways, we're just learning the disturbance. The other thing we do is the tether then has a counterbalancing system. So we carefully wait for each experiment to try to get to the minimum tether sort of you know, bias.
I had a, I don't know too much about the Koopman style modeling, but I saw in your slides that um, you enforce constraints in the NPC in the lifted space, especially when you're learning that lifting. How do you ensure that those constraints are actually meaningful and getting you the It's a great question. Well, there's two ways to do it. Actually, the way we do it most of the time is we take the lifted space and we have a projection operator and we project it back down. So we actually satisfy the constraint in the original space. Uh, so, but it's by having then this lifting, unlifting operator. Um, and then another question I had is when you were talking about your risk averse uh, planning, you're planning risk averse with respect to some cost function, you notice that even if I set my risk tolerance, it's fair, fairly in the, like it still avoids collisions even if you're fairly sens insensitive to risk. Um, that depends on what you're risk sensitive towards, the cost function that you're being risk sensitive towards. How did you design that? How do you get, how do you reason about that trade-off? Yeah, so the simulations I showed there, we showed very risk to moderate risk. We didn't necessarily show the gap from moderate to no risk as well. So then you see a, a much more of a transition sort of in that period. Um, you know, we try to make the theory general for whatever cost function you want, but typically, like I said, we use some of the classical cost functions like CVAR. Uh, on the sort of um, actually chance constraints. So in this particular case for the obstacle avoidance is straightforward, it's what's the distance between you and the nearest point in the obstacle. And so calculate the, your estimate of CVAR uh, on the collision uh, constraint. Thank you. Uh, Gary Tuck, thank you so much. Um, uh, I was uh, uh, about the uh, Kukman operator part that uh, you do lifting. Um, uh, have you studied how this uh, lifting can affect real-time uh, performance of NPC? Yeah, and so one of the things that you do is, is I'm a practical engineer, I want everything to be real-time. Uh, so you see everything there, you know, runs real-time. And so uh, what you trade off is the more dimensions you lift, the more accurate you're going to get the approximation, uh, but the slower that you run. So it, oftentimes in practice, the dimension we lift to isn't yet uh, dictated by a rigorous theory, it's dictated by what can we get to run in real time. Um, and so we're trying to work on the rigorous theory. We're not the only ones. There's lots of people right now. Uh, I would point you to some beautiful recent work by Jorge Cortez at UC San Diego, who's been looking at how can you choose the dimension of the lifting so you can then actually bound the error, uh, the, uh, you can approximate what is the error in your dynamical system. As you know, measuring error in dynamics is a, is a tricky thing, and so you have to, you know, there's issues with that. Hi, uh, great talk. I was wondering for the um, uh, wind gusts. So um, in the arena, if I understand the wind is constant, whereas there's, there's some variation in it. Uh, but I'll be frank with you, like I said, this is only about a month old, you know, kind of work. Uh, and, and so we're working currently on the variations. Um, I have a couple of strategies we're thinking about. I'm happy to discuss those, but I'm not sure that's your question. Yeah, I was wondering uh, if you had thoughts on learning dynamics when the dynamics are time varying and how to design well, You and I chatted briefly at lunch, yeah. and so we're looking at can we actually make Koopman a meta-adaptive uh, kind of approach so that basically we can kind of fold together different dynamical systems adaptively in real time to deal with the different gusts. There's going to be a lower limit, right? We're not going to be able to correspond to every small little transient in the winds, and there it, you basically use robustness, you know, and have to just accept some tolerance in your positioning. And so if you're doing things like obstacle avoidance or other tasks like manipulation, you then have to build that into, you know, the planning technique. I was maybe wondering also for the risk sensitive controllers, do you think there would have been other ways of making so is a risk approach necessary to have robots that account for uncertainty? No, I can't say that. Uh, on the other hand, um, we were actually kind of surprised how good our results were. Mm -hmm. I actually wasn't expecting that. Um, the thing that I haven't had a chance to do is we'd be able to extend it to both nonlinear systems and actually non-Gaussian noise. Um, so, you know, the technique's pretty general, and actually we've been able to recently move it beyond aerial systems to ground systems. And actually on the ground, it has an interesting effect. It's almost like uh, an autonomous guided vehicle. So when the vehicles are going around under this control or another vehicle comes in front, it basically stops and it waits for it to go by and then sort of continues on. So it has many, many nice properties. I'm sure you could come up with a better theory. Uh, and this is the one that we found and it's working for us, so we're sticking with it at the moment. I have a question regarding the equipment lifting. So you mentioned something about 
uh, manipulation. So is it more? Right. So is it more effective for, for instance, like the the wind? It's more soft compared to, for instance, if you had like a lot of con contacts, like in the manipulation case for the equipment lifting. I uh, didn't quite hear that. Uh, Yeah, it's a good question. I don't have the answer for you. Uh, we're actually working on that right now. Um, what I can tell you is there is there's only two papers. So the good news is when I started doing Koopman work six you know six years ago, you could read the entire literature in a week. Uh, now you can't keep up with the literature. It's rapidly expanding. The last time I checked, there's only two papers in the literature on hybrid Koopman systems. So that's the idea is that actually think about a hybrid dynamical system. So there is a nascent theory for dealing with hybrid Koopman system, but it's really nascent. Um, you know, and um, it's open area. That's one of the reasons I work in this, and there's still lots of open questions. I, I do probably need to, to adjourn. Uh, thank you again for your time, and yeah. <clears throat>